In this video, I want to talk about some examples of exactly the, the types of questions, types of research that evolutionary biologists carry out. In the previous video, I laid out a number of general types of questions with some brief examples of what evolutionary biologists, paleontologists, and evolutionary anthropologists study. In this video, I just want to provide a few more details of those examples. So, a question that is studied by many evolutionary biologists and evolutionary anthropologists is how did life evolve over time? How did previous species get replaced by the current species we see today? Often we use the fossil record and paleontology to, in order to address these questions. And this is especially important for the study of human origins and how humans emerged from ancestors that were ape-like. So for examples, we can use paleontology and the fossil record to examine how over approximately 10 or more million years, humans evolved from previous ape-like ancestors. For example, Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus were other lineages that preceded the human lineage that we now all belong to. Another question that, a general question that evolutionary biologists consider is cladogenesis. So an example of this type of question is understanding how modern birds, which are a type of theropod, dinosaur, how that clade of organisms emerged from previous clades. For example, we know from the final fossil record, we've, or we've determined from the fossil record, that many millions of years ago, there were dinosaur-like reptiles, and over time, there emerged several groups of what we would call non-avian dinosaurs. And eventually, a clade of organisms that we consider to be closely related, avian dinosaurs, emerged. And so this is the property of the process of cladogenesis. Previously, there were no bird-like dinosaurs, and eventually a distinct group of dinosaurs emerged. All of them have gone extinct except our current birds, which are actually currently considered to be dinosaurs. Within the process of Genesis, we often consider the particular process of speciation, which is how ancestral species over time split or transition into different kinds of species. And this, of course, is the process that gave rise to, the, to Darwin's book, the name of Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. So this is obviously a question that is of perennial and long-standing interest to biologists. Darwin's fishes are a classic case study in the process of speciation. It's been determined that all of Darwin's finches evolved from a single finch species, or it's strong, there is strong evidence that a single finch species is from mainland South America is the ancestral species to all of the finches that occur on the Galapagos Islands. Sometimes in the past, a small number of these individuals from a, of individuals from a population of this finch uh, somehow made it to the Galapagos Islands. Perhaps they were blown over there by a strong storm. And when they set up populations on the islands, they evolved and adapted to that, to the environment of the Galapagos. And moreover, they began to diversify and develop into separate populations and separate species. So that now the single finch species from mainland South America evolved into numerous species and even several genera of finches that occur on the Galapagos Islands. So this is the proceation process of speciation. So Darwin 
actually was not particularly interested in the finches that he collected on the Galapagos, but eventually he came to pose the question many years later after returning home, how exactly did the finches originally get to the island and how did they diversify? How did one species of finch diversify into so many different kinds of species? So we consider this to be the process of speciation and diversification where multiple species form within a clade. And again, Darwin did actually not pose this question while he was in the Galapagos. It was not until some time later that he began to look at those specimens differently. Another key question that evolutionary biologists consider is where do new traits evolve from and how do those traits evolve? And by novel traits, we mean something that is brand new, at least to a clade or a lineage, or possibly brand new to nature entirely, some trait that has never been, never occurred before on planet Earth. So, for example, as tetrapods, four-legged, four-limbed organisms evolved over time, they developed a number of novel adaptations. The first, of course, being limbs, four limbs, tetra meaning four. Those four limbs are thought to have been key to allowing organisms to emerge onto land, to evolve from a purely aquatic lifestyle, emerge from the ocean, and to begin to live partial and then fully life's lifestyles on land. Mammals are a type of tetrapod and they exhibit several important novelties including fur and also lactation. Here's an example of several puppies that are in the process of feeding and so mammals are the only organisms that produce milk for their young in this way. Turtles are another group that have a unique novel adaptation which is bones fused to form a protective carapace. Turtles are not the only organism that developed this strategy. This, there's a few times this convergently occurred throughout evolutionary history, but they're the only group of organisms alive now that have this evolutionary novelty. Once we have a trait or a new trait that has evolved, then that trait can continue to change and diversify over time, which is the process of trait evolution. Darwin's finches are well known for the fact that they occupy many different habitats and they have beaks that are specialized to particular habitats and particular ecological roles. So Darwin, long after returning from the Galapagos Island, pose the question, more or less, how did finches end up with bills and bodies that were of so many different shapes and sizes? How did their the trait of a beak or a bill change into so many diverse shapes and sizes? So for example, there are beaks that have large bills, large beaks that are primarily for cracking large seeds from fruits. There are medium size that are for smaller fruits and seeds. There are even smaller specialized bills for very small seeds that come from grasses. And then finally, there is the cactus finch that has a beak and a life history that is adapted for feeding from cactus. All of these species are very closely related. They are all in the genus Geospiza, but they have developed bills and beak, or rather beaks, that are specialized to very, um, very separate, different ecological niches. Here's another picture that shows a similar, um, similar uh, set of beaks. However, it includes two representatives from the Geospiza genus, and then also representatives from other genera, including the green warbler, which has a very small, thin bill adapted for eating arthropods, and the small tree finch that eats both arthropods, insects, and seeds. So we have four very closely related species in three different genera, three, two gen the genus Geospiza, these two genuses here, and they have four different types of beaks that all are specialized for different, um, different purposes.
Another consideration is how within a species traits can vary and a classic consideration here, classic case study, is are the moths that during the Industrial Revolution uh, changed their frequency. Early, um, previously, the most common version of this moth, moth was uh, light colored and speckled colored and after the Industrial Revolution and throughout the 20th century, in many places in England, this dark morph became the most common. This other lighter morph continued to occur, but the dark morph was more common. Then in the late 20th century, after the 1970s or so, as uh, environmental laws uh, changed how industry, how much uh, pollution could come from industry, the, the frequencies reversed and the dark moth, dark version of the moth became less common and the light version of the moth became more common. It's important to note here that these are the same species. They can interbreed. What's changing is the, the frequency of the color morphs. Here's a graph that was assembled that compiled data from a number of studies showing how from 1960 to 2010, the frequency changed from almost 100% or a proportion of one in the mid 20th century were all the dark black morph. And then over time, in, uh, by 1990, the proportion was around 60%. It can uh, black to light colored. That proportion continued to decline throughout the, the 2000s. And currently, in many places where biologists sample the samples are almost entirely of the, the light morph, the more the, the dark morph still does occur occasionally. So again, these are just some brief examples talking about or explaining how these different questions can be considered by evolutionary biologists.